Check, check, I check. Your Coco Jumbo. Hey, it's weird. Oh. It's my channel, but I keep, I keep, uh, I click on it and I expect, uh, 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 uh. like, hey, wrong channel, wrong channel, buddy. It's just, it's such a good tune that you want to hear it. It is, it is a jam. Yeah, it is, it is amazing. It is, amazing. and we know why. I mean. As a wise man once said, the eyes are the leather strap of the anus. <laughs> Gosh, I have to go there immediately. No, <laughs> it's messed up because there are people who didn't see the live stream yesterday who aren't going to know yeah. what we're talking about. Right? <laughs> so I actually prepared for this. I was thinking, oh man, I might accidentally blurt that out <laughs> during the live stream. That's like the first thing I go to. Um, so people, we're talking about this. We're talking about the famous saying of Muhammad <laughs> that the eyes are the leather strap of the anus. So here it is, ladies and gentlemen. Don't think I'm just randomly, randomly saying creepy things. Hey, AP, you know what's weird? Yes. Uh, look, look at what Muhammad says here. Let me see. Look at what Muhammad says here. Narrated Abu Huraira, Allah's messenger said, I've been sent with the shortest, shortest expressions bearing the widest meanings. And of course, you know, I normally quote this for other purposes. Like right after this, he says, I've been made victorious with terror. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> but before that, I've been sent with the shortest expressions bearing the widest meanings. In other words, he's appealing to his uh, supernatural <laughs> eloquence. <laughs> The that shortest is... expressions with the widest meanings. And then you're like, what, Muhammad? What are the shortest expressions bearing the widest meanings? Oh, well, it's stuff like this. The eyes are the leather strap of the anus. <laughs> <laughs> so, so profound. Wow. You could, you could spend a lifetime meditating. <laughs> meditating on this. The, fu the funny thing is uh, <laughs> some traditional scholars have deemed that hadith to be to be weak. Like... Uh, they, and then there is this guy, uh, um, this this scholar, was it Albani? I think it's him. Albani. He he comes and and uh, and classifies as, it as Hassan as good evidence. Yeah, and good. I'm just I'm just wondering based on 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 what he did that. And and when I see stuff like that, I I think that that scholar who is taking as such a big you know giant really sit down and think oh you know this hadith about how the eyes are the leather straps of the anus this one is definitely a good evidence i i, I am sure that he it is it is very very conceivable that the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam indeed uttered these wonderful words mm -hmm. <laughs> um that's uh yeah, it's rough to cast it aside because I found like a dozen or so versions of this that use different words but are getting at the same idea. And uh, you were you were trying to explain it to me last night. I didn't get it. And then I read a bunch of different versions and a little bit of commentary. And so for people who are confused about that, what Muhammad was saying, apparently it, the, the leather strap that he's talking about is a leather strap that was used to seal a, a water skin or a water bottle. And so he's saying that when your eyes are open, you can control the bottle, like you know, like like having a leather strap on a bottle. You can control stuff from coming out of it, <laughs> but that when you're asleep, the leather strap, your eyes are gone, and so stuff leaks out of the bottle while, while you're asleep. Stuff leaks out of your anus while you're asleep. <laughs> so perform your ceremonial washings, yeah, to uh to deal with that problem. So something along those. So now you guys know all of you who made fun of that quotation from Muhammad. Now you understand it's even dumber than you thought. <laughs> I think I just caught the, the, the meaning behind it, the explanation because because uh, I'm I don't know. I think it's 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 a, it's a cultural thing, I guess. I, I heard stuff like that my whole life and <laughs> AP's whole life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember. Don't... Remember, little AP, the eyes are the leather strap of the anus. Oh, wow. Okay. Great. Wow. OK, I remember that. <laughs> But it's just funny that Muhammad's bragging that he's his words are so profound and his miraculous yeah. eloquence. And it's like, Don't you see these beautiful words? Yeah. Wow. Imagine you want to say, hey, you have to perform your washings uh, after you sleep because of anything that might have slipped out during the night. Like, why? Do, why are you talking about your eyes and leather strap of your <laughs> and your anus and stuff like that? Just just say, guys, perform your ablutions when you wake up in case anything. You know, slipped out. It. <laughs> you know what? That actually, uh, it actually looks like he was 
he was quite shy about expressing such things to people. So he was uh, trying to use, uh, you know, uh, poetic language in order to, 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 to package stuff like that and deliver it to his audience. Instead of just saying, hey, you know, guys, when you sleep, lots of stuff might come out. So do the ablution. It's mm-hmm. like, the eyes are the leather straps of the anus. Poor I show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the comments. Yeah. Hey, check this out. This is uh, Theta Ali. David Wood, you are sick, man. Hey, I'm not the one saying the eyes are the leather strap of the anus here. Uh, you are sick, man, and you maybe have some mentally, some mentality health issue as I seen it on you somehow, but I am not a doctor. You're not a doctor? figured you're extremely well educated and I, I will ignoring what you are saying because your health. Well, thank you for ignoring what I'm saying, even though you just commented uh, on it. Uh, so right, I, have, uh, I have no idea what you're trying to convey, Zaid Ali, but thank you for the comment. Pretty powerful. Uh, uh, all right. So <clears throat> AP. Yes. When the Ali Dawa clips uh, of him saying uh, that the scientific miracles argument had been debunked, uh, Lots of people were shocked, and I was thinking, well, Ali Dawa is not going to say something like that without getting it from someone else. He's not the most original fellow in the world. He's a popularizer. Uh, but I knew where he was getting that from. He was getting that from Hamza Tsortsis. And, and I was thinking his essay, but it turns out that Hamza has done videos explaining why the scientific miracles argument has been debunked. And so what I found when I actually went to his videos on the topic is he does a much better job of explaining why the scientific miracles argument has been debunked than Ali Dawa. Oh, now, hold on, hold on. You're saying somebody's doing a better job at explaining something than Ali Dawa? That's ridiculous. Yeah, isn't that a... Like, if you had to compare these guys, <laughs> who, would you, who would you rather actually just have a conversation with about <laughs> uh, about Islam? Hamza Sorsis or Ali Dawa? <laughs> I, I guess everyone will give you the same answer. I mean, when I look at uh, Hamza Tortoise, uh, I explained this to you before the before the, the stream started. But when I look at that guy, it's, it's just he has a friendly face. I feel like this is a guy that I can sit down with and have a have an interesting conversation with. I would also like to sit down with uh, him and have a have a very interesting conversation about about Islam and about Muhammad and all of that. He looks very. He looks like a very friendly. Uh, fellow, so I would prefer uh, Hamza Tortoise to uh, Ali Dawa. But you keep, saying, think... you keep saying Tortoise. What? You're just misunderstanding me. Sortsis. Uh, Sortsis. So... Wait a minute. I was thinking maybe you can't pronounce that sound, but Germans have that sound. That's, that's... <laughs> you got me. Uh... <laughs> yeah, no, Hamza Sortsis uh, is, I, w- I would prefer him. Yeah. But the thing is, he has some sleazy aspects in, in how he presents Islam and how he associates with uh, terrible people, with extremists. I mean, with 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 what, what am I saying? Extremists. I mean, with these with Muhammad Tijab and Ali Dawa, and he's ready to protect them and also spread their uh, hostile, nonsensical views. But yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Hussein here says uh, Hamza Tsortsis was proven wrong by an embryologist in a video. Yes, that's actually what set him on the path to rejecting the argument. And this is to his credit. And again, even though Ali Dawa has to ruin everything he says by oh, die in your rage, right? <laughs> even though he has to say all this stuff that ruins any any valid point that he's making, uh, we can still, again, one hundred percent sincerity here. Not 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 joking. We can still. Give him credit where credit is due. He acknowledged that a very popular argument, the go-to argument for people like uh, Zucker Nike, has been debunked and it, telling Muslims to stop using that argument. Um, so that's wow. to his credit. But uh, And to Hamza's credit, uh, once he got schooled on the argument, he said, OK, we, we need to stop using this argument. And it's not just that. It, keep in mind, it's not just oh, I got embarrassed on the argument, therefore it's debunked, because you could always say, okay, I didn't know what I was talking about, I'll go study more. I'll go study the Quran more and learn even better arguments or something like that. He actually learned and figured out what the problems in the argument, why it's been uh, debunked, why the argument is bogus, and he's going to break it down for us. But uh, uh, AP, you know what's interesting? Yes. When Ali Dawa posted his Part of the reasons for the follow up video was Muslims were saying, ah, you need to clarify what you mean, because some people think that you're saying the scientific miracles argument has been debunked. 
<laughs> Are so, you saying that? <laughs> and you can't be saying that because we know this is the greatest argument in the world. This is Zucker Knight's yeah. go-to argument, right? Yeah. Um, let me give you an, but even after, even after he, uh, he said very clearly that it's been debunked. Uh, so Mike, Mike Jones made a video. So inspiring philosophy, Mike Jones, he made a short or for like TikTok or something like that saying, Hey, even Ali Dawa now admits that the argument has been debunked. I want to show this video of, uh, a Muslim saying that no, Ali Dawa is definitely not saying the. <laughs> It's definitely not saying the scientific miracles argument has been debunked. So uh, let's check this out real quick. Let's do that. Is now admitting the Islamic argument from scientific miracles in the Quran has been debunked. No, he did not. No, he did. If you look at what Ali Dawa and others of the same group say, like Hamza Sorsis and Muhammad Hijab and others concerning the relationship between science and the Quran, they do recognize that there are scientific facts, like uh, which are even miraculous, like. Uh, the mentioning of the mountains uh, function in stabilizing Earth's crust and others. Uh, so notice, Mike, Mike Jones says, Ali Dawa says the scientific miracles argument has been debunked. And the guy cuts him off right in the middle of the word debunk. No, that's not what he said. <laughs> and then he gives, his he gives his example of something that these guys would never say has been debunked. And that's the amazing uh, uh, stabilizing function of mountains. Let me see what he says here. Of the Wait. mountains uh, function. Wait, what? You want to say something? Which, by the way, is not even accurate, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I agree. You, you made a video on, how do you interpret the, uh, the uh, w when the Quran is talking about mountains and it's talking about something to do with stability, if you read it in light of what the Quran says, especially if you take into consideration what the commentators said, it sounds like everything, you know, the seven earths, the seven flat earths are sitting on the back of a giant uh, whale or fish. And that thing gets agitated and starts flopping around. And yeah. so because it flops around, Allah put mountains as these tent pegs yeah. to uh, hold everything in place. Is that how, is that how you're reading it? Yeah, that's that's uh, how I'm reading it. There are different interpretations in the in the in the tafsirs, uh, but also in general, when you just read it on, on on the surface, what it describes is how Allah creates the earth. He uh, he he makes it as a bed on top of the water, and above it he he puts the heaven. He installs it, and then uh, in order to stabilize the earth because it could shake for some for different reasons, he then puts these these pegs uh, as mountains into the earth. That's what the Quran literally describes. It doesn't uh, say in a, say in any uh, place in any uh, passage that mountains are actually meant to prevent earthquakes. And even if it did say that, that wouldn't even be scientifically accurate. <laughs> yeah, so, this is yeah. weird stuff. Let's see. But so this guy gives one example of something that he, according to him, Hamza he he names Hamza Tortis isn't saying has been debunked. And so they grant that there are these scientific facts. Let's see what he says here. Uh, mentioning of the mountains uh, function in stabilizing Earth's crust and others, and others. But they say we should not be forceful into this. We don't exaggerate because we don't need it. We have a lot of miracles, a lot of prophetic uh, elements and information and proofs for Islam. And also some of them are scientific, but we should not be forceful into that. And that type of forceful extremist uh, revisionism of the Quran in a scientific uh, key should not happen. That's all they say. Look it up. Michael Jones fails again. No surprise there. He's out. Michael Jones. He said Michael Jones fails again. He, but I love it when they say look it up, not thinking that we'll actually look it up. <laughs> so that was that entire that entire clip was a response, supposedly a response to Mike Jones claiming that Ali Dawa has said the scientific miracles argument has been debunked. The guy cuts him off. No, he, he didn't say it's been debunked. Yeah, obviously we will now find out that Ali Dawa definitely has not said that, right? Yeah, let's go ahead and look at the, uh, we're not going to look at the entire Ali Dawa video because we've already been through both of them. Yeah. Um, but let's go ahead and look at some clips of whether he says that the scientific miracles argument has been debunked. So... What did Ali Dawa actually say? And keep in mind, we did go through the place where he says there are things that you can still be amazed by. Like, oh, isn't that amazing that Allah talks about this? 
But he's saying as far as using this as an argument, it doesn't work. But let's see what Ali Dawa actually says, since our friend here says that's not what he says. I One of the reasons I accepted Islam was the scientific miracles. I'll be honest with you. And now we know that this whole scientific miracles was absolute nonsense. Not to- What? Absolute nonsense? <laughs> and he says not total nonsense because there are things that you can find interesting and stuff. But he says absolute nonsense and debunked. In total. But guess what? Allah led me to Islam. One of the reasons was because of the scientific miracles. And guess what? Did I leave Islam when this whole scientific miracle thing got debunked? No, I stayed Whoa. because I... Wait, did he say debunked? I thought he said debunked there. I, I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's probably our senses fooling us. I don't think he said that. So. Maybe Allah is tricking us into thinking that we saw that when we actually didn't. That's what he did with Jesus. And yeah, yeah, yeah. He tricked Christians into creating a, the biggest uh, false religion in the world. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Grew in faith. So in the Andrew Tate video that I did, I mentioned that the scientific miracles in the Quran were debunked. Okay, so now he's going to correct it. He said, yes, I said debunked. And now all the Muslims said, ah, can you clarify what you mean? This is our favorite argument. How dare you? Please clarify what you actually meant, because we know you can't mean that it was actually debunked. Let's see. He's going to and for some it. odd reason, funnily enough, like as if they thought that it was a slip of the tongue. I'll repeat it again, very carefully. The scientific miracles argument in the Quran got debunked. Wait, I thought that's what he... <laughs> I thought Mike Jones lied about that. <laughs> he he, uh, Mike Mike Jones got it wrong. He he was also tricked by Allah into believing that he is saying that we are all just being tricked right now. Ali Dawa never said it's been debunked. He's wow. actually trying to apologize right now. Allah sure does a great job tricking everyone. He didn't wow. just trick us. You're right. He tricked. He tricked Mike Jones and he tricked lots of Muslims into thinking that Ali Dawa is saying debunked here when he's actually not. Let's see. Yeah, I hope my Tajweed was on point. That's that's funny. I hope my touch when he's debunked. I hope my Tajweed is on point. That's like pronunci- your, your great pronunciation, yeah. your beautiful pronunciation of the Quran. He's saying, let me make sure I pronounce that word debunked properly. So when I said this, a lot of um, Islamophobes were celebrating as if I was like, oh my gosh, like, this video is going to be me apologizing. We were celebrating. No. Listen, it got debunked. So that's what I'll repeat right. one more time for my fans. Those Islamophobes. For your fans. The scientific argument, the scientific miracles of the Quran is debunked. I don't know how he can so make it any clearer. So me seeing the argument of scientific miracles debunked, it is debunked. And guess what? We don't even need it. We're it proud is debunked. of that. This, this so, is so dumb. I, I don't understand the logic here at all. Not that uh, I expect much logic here, but he's he's saying, and the Islamophobes say we're so happy about this and they were celebrating and they thought I would sit here and apologize. But no, I will confirm once again, it has been debunked. That's what we wanted. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> why why would we be happy? Why would we be happy if you say, oh, I, I'm sorry, I was wrong. We are happy because you confirm once again that it's been debunked. What an idiot. <laughs> yeah, we're sitting there going again. We're sitting there. Go, Ali, go, Ali, go, go, Ali, go, Ali, go, go, Ali, go, Ali, go, 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 go. And, uh, <laughs> and he's like, oh, now die in your rage. You're all enraged. <laughs> like, what, what planet do you guys? <laughs> Up House of Hikma. House of Hikma says he said debunked. Oh. Two words. So it's something else. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Isn't it amazing, though? And I guess I guess it's related because it's like if you spend the past two decades finding all these scientific miracles in the Quran and, you know, when the Quran says that the sun sets in a muddy pool or that stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot demons when they try to sneak into paradise or that semen is formed between the backbone and the ribs, you just get used to reinterpreting anything to mean anything you want. And so even when Ali Dawa can sit there and go, it's debunked, 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 debunked. You say, hey, he said debunked. No, liar, liar, wrong. Mike Jones has been exposed again. He said it. He said that Ali Dawa said it's been debunked. But Ali Dawa never said such an, any such thing. What is this? What is this religion, man? You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of Fight Club. Of the, did, I, did I say that before? I mean, the, the mindless uh, followers of the, the character Tyler Durden where um, they defend him no matter what he does and they cheer him on. And then even when he, when, when, when the actual guy starts contradicting him, they're like, no, no. And <laughs> I don't know. They this have is... to, they have to put it straight. They have to fix what he just said. And that's, that's how they treat their, uh, their, their, their God, their scripture, their prophet, their influencers and their pop YouTubers like Adawa. It's very, very crazy. 
hey, check this out. I went ahead and since the guy said, look it up, I went ahead and looked it up. The mountains. He gave one example, the mountains. That's the miracle, right? That Hamza yeah. Sorza still says is a scientific miracle. Now, Hamza is actually going to give multiple reasons for rejecting the argument. He's going to say science changes and therefore you shouldn't be clinging to any scientific position when it, it could change in the future. Two, how do you know that what the Quran is actually saying? How do you know that it's actually saying this scientific thing? And three, did Muhammad know this ahead of time? I mean, in other words, did, did other people know it and Muhammad could have got this information from them? And Hamza uh, specifically refers to this uh, mountains issue uh, here. The mountains have roots miracle. Consider the verse. So he gives this as an example of something that you could have found elsewhere. But I would say that's the that's only one of the problems, because, again, another one is, is that what is the, the Quran saying? And two, is science even lining up with what you're what is being said here? Uh, but the mountains have the mountains have roots miracle. Consider the verses speaking about uh, mountains having pegs or roots. The Quran states, "Have we not made the earth as a wide expanse and the mountains as pegs?" This knowledge was already available via the ancient Hebrews, as the Old Testament explicitly mentions the roots of the mountains. And he goes ahead and. Uh, quotes the Bible here, uh, the roots of the mountains. I've never heard a Christian use that as any sort of argument. Um, I don't think you'll ever run into a Christian using that argument. But uh, and again, I think there are far more problems with what the with what the Quran is actually saying there. But suppose you granted that mountains have roots, and how could anyone know this? Hamza points out the Jews were saying it before Muhammad did. It's so funny that even when he's uh, when he's um, saying, you know what, this is actually not a miracle. This is actually not some revolutionary knowledge. He then still goes to the to the Bible and uh, completely reads something uh, in a very Islamic literalist way to then interpret it as uh, a foreknowledge of something scientific. It's 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 very strange. But yeah, go ahead. it's very strange. All right, should we go ahead and get into this video? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I have found that the longer a video, I mean, we only get through like an eight to 10 minute video uh, safely during a live stream because you talk too much. Um, <laughs> yeah, this video is longer. I think it's almost 20 minutes, but he does such a good job explaining why this argument has been debunked that I don't think I need to even actually add much commentary because he does a bang up job. All right. We ready to go into this? We could turn this into four different live streams where we can watch the whole video. But yeah, I think we can get through it because uh, again, I don't, I don't even need to say much. So you just jump in anytime you want. I'll, I'll probably say a couple words here or there. But uh, okay, okay, all right. Okay. And and those of you who are watching, be sure to. I mean, he he does a good job. And guys, you probably, the rest of you, especially if you are dealing, if you're going to be talking to Dawa fans who still use this argument. It's good to be able to break down. He actually breaks down the various kinds of problems with this argument. It's good to be able to go ahead and say those. So, oh, can you start the video already? Hamza Tsortsis is better than Ali Dawa. Let's find out why. Yeah, yeah. Assalamu alaikum, brothers, sisters, and friends. Welcome to a new episode of the GDM show, the Global Dawa Movement show. On this week's show, we're more like Global Dawa Destruction. Uh, <laughs> ah. Gosh, I just said I didn't need a comment and I couldn't make it six seconds without okay. global demolition. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Hey, with brother Hamza. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, brother Hamza? Good to see you, bro. Same, man. Likewise. So, we've got a very special show planned for you guys this week and next week. It's going to be a two part show and it's to do with the scientific miracles in the Quran. Yes. The, the narrative that we see out there, which is that there are miracles in the Quran, the, the science proves the Quran, and so on and so forth. Right? Yes. We're going to be discussing this. And I have some very interesting questions I have lined up for you to Good. really break this down. Thank you. And to share the truth, basically, with the people, right? Yes. So the first question I'm going to ask you, we'll go straight into this, that is, what are the scientific miracles of the Quran? Hey, hey, hey P, uh, when did you leave Islam? How long ago was that? How long ago? 2014 or something like that. So you were a Muslim in the during the heyday. Yeah. During the heyday yeah. of the scientific miracles argument. Yeah. So of course. Okay. Yeah. Did you were, did you ever find those interesting when you were a Muslim? Um. To be honest, not really. Okay. No. That's good. 
That's good. All right. Because if you if you had found them powerful and interesting, you would have stayed a Muslim because of those awesome arguments. And now you'd be now you'd be crying your eyeballs out. Well, I would say that um, I think I didn't find them impressive. Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, let's let's right. just move on. Just move on. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The scientific miracles of the Quran claim is usually articulated in the following three ways. And and, and I don't want to keep interrupting, but I'm just I pointed out that people should be taking notes on this. This is something you want to. Uh, I guess you could. The the problems that he points out with are going to be more important, but. Uh, as far as the articulation, pay attention to the different ways this argument is put. I have these written down. Number one, the Prophet Muhammad, upon whom be peace, did not have access to the scientific knowledge mentioned in the Quran. Therefore, it must be from God. Number two, another way of putting it is, no one at the time of Revelation, which was the 7th century, had access to the necessary equipment to understand or verify the scientific knowledge in the Quran. Therefore, it must be from God. And number three, the Quranic verses were revealed at a time where science was so primitive, no human could have uttered the truths mentioned in the Quran, therefore it's from God. Right. So that's the kind of way many of the Muslims at different levels in society articulate a case for the Quran. Right, okay, excellent. So before And so that's aren't, aren't two and three basically the same thing? I don't Yeah, they're all they're all very similar. It's it's yeah. there's no way for Muhammad to know this stuff during his time. And so it couldn't be verified during his time or you didn't have access to this kind of knowledge during his time. And whatever it is, it's the only the only actual source for these amazing scientific insights is if they come from God. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Powerful. Uh, FAS said, uh, is this Hamza guy from Pakistan? No, he is actually of Greek origin. Yeah. Sorts. Uh, that's why that's why he has a Greek last name. Sorts. Uh, yeah. Which, according to AP, means tortoise, but I don't believe him. <laughs> I never said that, but yeah, go ahead. Going to the whole uh, narrative, the first thing I want to ask you is for you to give us a bit of a background and why we can't claim a miracle, a miracle, the, the scientific mentions in the Quran. Okay, there are three major milestones to what I'll call this kind of science in the Quran movement. Yeah, right. the, this guy, he does. It's always going to be three, but. Yeah, yeah. Hey, don't say three, Hamza. What the <laughs> heck? I hey, notice, notice Allah says, don't say three. And this guy says, breaks everything down into threes. Huh. Yeah. Coincidence? Do it's not say three. Desist. Uh, yeah. Uh, so guys, this is, he gives the three major, he calls them milestones. Perfect word for these. Uh, so the major events that led Muslims to be in the position that they are in now, where you have so many Dawah fans thinking that scientific miracles are the main, or at least one of the main uh, confirmations of the Quran. So pay attention, because he is absolutely correct here in what led to this, the three main events. The first one is based on the book that was written by Dr. Maurice Bukel called The Bible, the Quran and Science. It was written in 1976. And as you can imagine, this book basically said the Quran is in line with modern science. The Bible isn't. Muslims took this, translated it in many languages. I believe you know, some people memorized more of this book than they did of the Quran. Right? It just became a, it was a movement. Uh -huh. Even some academics have called this movement Bukalism. That's what, okay? that's what There are some now. journals that basically talk about this movement and refer to it as Bukalism. And it was, uh, that book is, I mean, that is massively deceptive. I mean, you'd have to be an yeah. idiot to read these passages as confirming uh, various scientific theories. And uh, that's why, I mean, again, Maurice Bukai worked for King Faisal, uh, was not a Muslim, didn't convert, works for King Faisal, um, and uh, comes out with this book uh, saying that the Quran is filled with these scientific miracles and uh muslims ran with it uh they rallied around that and so that's basically the andrew tate of its time it's the andrew <laughs> tate of its time the new thing that everyone clings to because yeah. they're desperate for confirmation the second milestone was something called commission on scientific signs in the quran and sunnah which was a commission in the 80s that produced a video called this is the truth and this was run by Sheikh Abdul Majid Az Zindani. Now, what they did in the 80s, I believe it was 1981 or 1982, is that they invited scholars, scientists from the West mm. 
to Arabia and basically <coughs> somehow got them to say some special things about the Quran. Yep. But we now know this is not true. The majority of those scientists have retracted those statements who have uh -huh. said that we, have, we were quote mined or whatever the case may be. And, and by the way, that was uh, Zindani. That, that guy was buddies with uh, Osama bin Laden. And if you oh, look yeah. at if you look at the textbook that they put out about these scientific uh, about some of the scientific miracles in embryology and so on, the uh, the um, the uh, you know the, the list of people you're you're acknowledging at the beginning. So the acknowledgments, Osama bin Laden's on the list as one of the guys who is funding this back in yeah. the early '80s. But you recall this because there was an awesome article. If you look up Wall Street Journal scientific miracles or something like that, it pops up. But in 2002, someone went and investigated this. Went to the scientist. The actual method was, and these guys they had it all planned out. They know what they're actually they know what they're doing. And guess what? You could use this if you really wanted to be deceptive. You could use this method to defend anything. You could use it to defend anything. So if you wanted to defend the scientific um, accuracy of some Hindu book, let's say, uh, just go in there, find some, find some Homer. It doesn't matter. Uh, find some things that are, you know, sound like they could be correct scientifically. Then invite, let's say, a hundred scientists to uh, to come and analyze various. Uh, quote mind quotes and ignore the context and so on give these guys a free vacation have them bring you know have them bring their spouses and so on bring them over shower them with gifts shower them with free vacations money all this stuff then put them on stage in front of a bunch of muslims who are looking you know looking uh you know enthralled by these scientists and so on put them on stage give them a quote and say is this impressive could muhammad have known this if you have 100 scientists, like 96 of them are going to say, no, I'm not impressed by that. Some of them, you can, you can prod them and they'll go, oh, yeah, that's really amazing. I'm just shocked by, by how amazing that is. And then, of course, for your dawah, you only quote the ones who actually confirmed it. And then later on, when these guys come back and, and, are, and are interviewed and they say, I was just trying to be nice. It was, you know, <laughs> they're, they're paying for all this stuff. I wanted to say something nice. That's what the guys actually said later on when they're asked. Mm -hmm. they're, saying, and they're basically trying to be nice. Uh, but you only quote those guys. You ignore the fact that they that they say, I, I didn't seriously think this is impressive. And you and you run around with it as a scientific miracle. You can walk up to a Dawa table. To, you can walk up to Sheikh Uthman Ibn Farouk's Dawa table today, pick up a brief illustrated guide to understanding Islam or one of their science tracks, and it will still use these particular guys from 1981 as the proof of the scientific miracles. So Hamza is not exaggerating here. This was a, it was a big scam. It was funded by terrorists and it was completely deceptive. It's a method that you could use to defend anything. And this is the, this is the evidence for Islam. You know what my problem with Hamza Tortsis is? Uh... Tortsis. So I, that's what I said. You said, you uh, said, you, you combined it there. You said Tortsis. Okay. I'm just trying to make it easy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I read, I, I bought his book, um, his one book, which is called The Divine Reality. I bought that like quite a while ago and I started reading it and I started reading the first chapter. And sometimes I have a little bit of a, of a problem, I guess, with um, when I get a very bad first impression, I feel much less motivated to read the, the rest of the book. And the book starts with uh, the best place to start uh, to start is with a definition. Atheism linguistically means not a theist. In other words, someone who does not believe in a god or gods. Um, now, he, so he says atheism linguistically means not a theist. First off, that would be atheist, not atheism, because atheism would be, if that is correct, uh, not theism but then again it also doesn't mean not a theist it basically literally means uh godless you know like without god so um he starts it he starts all of it with a completely wrong uh order and a misunderstanding of the etymology although that is what he focuses on at the very beginning therefore everything he says is wrong and that, we, ladies and gentlemen is ap nitpicking in order to avoid <laughs> the actual powerful arguments yeah, that Hamza yeah, precisely. Precisely. has presented. Uh, whose bookshelf do you prefer? Hamza Sources or Ali Dawa? Mine. Probably. Uh, I think Hamza's is better, but I think mine is significantly better. Because again, these guys go to like Ikea and get this stuff. 
I go to the, I go grab some lumber and build mine. Lumber, paint. The heck. Yeah, I don't even, yeah. I don't even buy, I don't even buy nice wood. I go get the standard lumber for construction. But if you know, and you're an expert, you could do that sort of thing. That's true. All right, let's get back to Hamza's here. So he went through two. So he went through two. So Bukai's uh, book on the amazing scientific accuracy of the Quran, then this big stunt they all pulled when they all, when that took off. And now we're going to have the third. Third one. milestone for this movement is the popularizers. You had the likes of Dr. Zakhar Naik and Sheikh Yusuf Estes and many other callers to Islam. Sheikh Yusuf Estes. <laughs> the guy who that says always... that the... Roman Catholic Church was founded by Alexander the Great in Rome three centuries before Christ. <laughs> that's, the, that's the only thing I think of whenever I, heard the, I hear that guy's name. <laughs> Wait, so he's, uh, he's one of the popularizers of this, eh? Yeah. Super powerful intellect he's got. All right. Surprise, who surprise. basically have articulated this case even myself many I think about three four five years ago I articulated something very similar not not as strong as this yeah. but we have found out now that it's actually an incoherent and not very robust way of, of showing that the Quran is true and the reason for that just to end on this point to answer this question the main reason we can't claim miracles yeah. and we're going to discuss many other reasons is because of the knowledge of what science is as a method and science is as a, as, as a philosophy, meaning the philosophy of science. So philosophy of science. So he's going to get, I think he lists, I think he lists two reasons, but if you look more closely, it's actually three reasons, three problems with the argument. And so his main, his main one here is going to be um, what science is and how it changes. So let's see. So if you go to the works of Goch and Sober, Rosenberg, Status Psilos, another. Uh, so he, he's actually he's actually citing philosophers of science. So Elliot Sober and um, Alexander Rosenberg and so on. So these are philosophers of science. I'm not sure he really understands philosophy of science really well, but uh, let's go and check. Philosophy out. of science and others. You see that science is limited. Yeah. For example, it's based on induction. Not only on induction, mm. but let's take induction as an example. Induction is a limited thinking process where you have a limited set of observations where you conclude for an unseen next observation or an entire set of, ob 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 set of observations known as weak and strong induction. As you can see, that's probabilistic reasoning. It's mm. not going to be 100% certain. It's always going to range from 0% to 99% because there's always a possibility of a future observation going against your previous conclusions which were based on previous observations an easy way of looking at it is using a crude example using sheep say i go to wales and i want to find out what the color of sheep are i, I count a thousand sheep they all happen to be white so using induction the next instance of sheep is going to be what color white, white, white. exactly but that doesn't mean that's true because it might be black right where have I heard that that, that analogy before? Is that, isn't that a popular thing or? Uh, the most pop, the most common, as far as when I was in school and induction was being broken down, is with uh, is with birds, like ravens. Uh, so you say yeah. you examine. So suppose you didn't know anything about ravens and you're just examining scientifically what what color ravens are, and you see a hundred ravens and they're all black. So you you draw an inference based on that, and you conclude all ravens are black. Um, and so the point of this being probabilistic is, well, you could, in theory, you could find a, a white raven, you know, at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, your, your, it, it, your conclusion would be false. Yeah. Um, so that's the idea that, and, and science in general is considered probabilistic in the sense that you're supposed to be open for uh, future disconfirmations of uh, of whatever uh, hypothesis or theory you're putting forward. The thing is, um, I mean, he probably he knows this, but um, that's the whole point of science, right? I mean, science is supposed to take that into consideration whenever uh, whenever science makes a conclusion uh, about something. So um, that is actually a strong point of of science. Um, He's now going to, I guess, go with this idea and um, comment on certain things that are uh, very, very much verifiable. But I'm really wondering where he's going to go with this. He, he, he actually, 
he, he's making important points because he's going to go on yeah. to say, imagine that you Muslims in the 19th century, so the 1800s, looked for scientific confirmation of the Quran. Well, the scientific theories they would have pointed to, oh my goodness, look, look at this, look at this. It, it would have been disconfirmed later. It would, it would be, you would, you would say the Quran that's, is that's affirming. Fair. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, his problem is he makes it sound like science isn't really getting you to the truth. It's always open and everything might be disconfirmed tomorrow. So notice right. as far as things that the Quran is claiming, like when they're talking about embryonic development and so on, the Quran gets things wrong. Uh, but but let's pretend it got things right with these basic steps and so on, like, uh, you know, semen has something to do with reproduction and so on. Um, it's seriously, it's not like five years from now, they're going to find out that semen doesn't have anything to do with human reproduction. Right. They're, you're not going you're not realistically going to find out, oh, it's actually a stork brings it. <laughs> Right. Like like yeah. some thing, some things we like in theory, you have to be open to the idea that something is going to be, you know, come along later in the future. But in reality, we understand a lot about, yeah. you know, how babies are made. We have a pretty yeah. good understanding of that. And, and a lot of it's not going to change. Some of the very minor details might change in the future. But the big picture, the stuff that Muhammad could have gotten right, the big picture, those things aren't actually going to change. So. To, to act like ah we can't we can't appeal to science because it's just you know it's changing all the time and uh, I'm not sure he's totally on the right page but his point is well received here. No, I, I definitely think that the point uh, is fair when you when when he says that Muslims should not rely on on science this much or that much when they uh, try to confirm the Quran uh, because of that that very specific point. I, I guess I'm just so used to hearing from these Muslim apologists this whole idea, science changes all the time. Uh, you know, the yardstick that you're using right now, it will be different tomorrow. Therefore, this is something that Ali Dawah and others have said. So I, I hope he just doesn't go there too much. And um, we'll see. Um, I mean, oh, uh, again, my issue with what he's saying is just like, you know, okay, I think you're a little overstating how much science is going to, uh, might change in the future. So, to, to be, to be sure, lots of theories are going to change at points in the, in the future and so on. That doesn't mean we don't really know a lot of stuff. Like the probability of a future disconfirming claim is, is, is pretty minute in some cases. Yeah. So, um, plenty of knowledge, but that. apart from, apart from that, he does a, he does an awesome job, just steamrolling, absolutely yeah. steamrolling. The scientific miracles argument because, because there are black sheep right knowledge. exactly we should sing in, in nursery rhymes bar bar oh, black sheep, sheep. Yeah. so the point is it just shows that singing is rum including from limited <laughs> observations doesn't give you certainty right okay and that's the beauty of science yeah. it's supposed to change based on new observations new understanding new discoveries and that's the beauty Yes. Now, understanding yes. this about science, and we've mentioned this in previous DDM shows, we would see that you can't now apply this to the Quran and claim mir miracle. Because you have to prove, or you have to show, that the science that you think is factual is never going to change. Mm -hmm. That's uh, th this actual, you know, this comment is uh, joking here, but it's making an important point. Um, like, if science is always changing, like, is it the case that five years from now scientists might actually discover that the sun sets in a muddy pool very way likely out, way out west like yeah. is that something that scientists might seriously find out so that that's my point as far as come on yeah. we we know quite a bit about science very likely yes all right absolutely impossible for many things yeah. like you know the the philosophers of science and the scientists themselves say that science is revisable yeah. And the other thing that you have to do is that the meaning you've chosen for a particular word in the Qur'an is the meaning intended by God. How do you know? Yeah, if you right. don't have any hadith to explain it, you don't have ijma, a consensus to explain these, these words, then you have to rely on the Arabic language and you have a m many layers of meaning for a particular word. That's yeah. how Tiramisu. You catch that? Many layers. <laughs> he yeah. said it. You, saw, you heard him say it. You heard him say yeah. This is the yeah. tiramisu argument. But uh, guys, did everyone ca did everyone catch that? Because he's going through two reasons. He's going to have a third. But one, when you appeal to science, you run the risk of the scientific theory changing in the future. And so if you're saying, ah, Allah, 
Allah predicted this, and then it changes later on, then oops, well, what happened to Allah predicted it? If Allah predicted it and, the, and then it changed, then Allah predicted wrong? Is that what you're going to say? So one, scientific theories can change. That is correct. That's one issue. Two, when you say, here's what Allah is actually saying in the Quran, how do you know that's what Allah is actually saying? How do you know you're not reading this into it? It's, it, it's like when, when Ali Dawah was talking about the, the Quran saying that there are seven heavens, and he interprets this as, uh, to quote him, seven ozone layers, right? Like, what, where are you getting, <laughs> one, that's stupid, but, but where are you getting from seven heavens that this is referring to seven ozone layers? Where are you, get, where are you getting that idea from? It's not the Quran saying it. It's not a commentator saying it. It's not Muhammad or one of his companions saying it. It's you trying to find some great scientific insight in the Quran and forcing it into it. And so he's saying you you can't do that. If you don't have Muhammad, if you don't have Muhammad or the, maybe the companions or something like that commenting on this, then you're putting your own interpretation in the Quran. And he's saying that's that's dangerous. There is actually a very good example to that, uh, which is that if you read the verse about the sun setting in a muddy spring, uh, almost every single Muslim today understands that as you know, it, it can't be literally saying that it must be a you know it must be metaphorical or something. But uh, if you go back into the history of the of, of Muslims and of how Muslims understood the Quran, if you look in the earliest uh, the earliest exegesis, you will find that um, the earliest exegesis, I, th I think, including Tabari, only. Uh, had an understanding of that verse as a as a literal understanding that the sun actually does go and set in a muddy spring. The idea that this might only be metaphorical came into existence later. So the early Muslims were making a completely uh, wrong observation based on their understanding of the Quran. And if Muslims nowadays want to um, claim that the Quran says something which they which they believe to be true according to science, they might be doing that very same uh, mistake, right? Uh -huh. of, of course, of course, the earliest Muslims, they were actually right in reading it exactly as it is and, uh, and reading something very stupid into it yep. because it was exactly that. Yeah. Might find out I'm, next week. I'm very happy that uh, <laughs> I'm very happy that you decided not to uh, pause the video too much. But yeah. You wanted to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> End the scientists themselves say that science is revisable. Yeah. And the other thing that you have to do is that the meaning you've chosen for a particular word in the Quran is the meaning intended by God. How do you know? Yeah. If you don't have any hadith to explain it, you don't have ijma, a consensus to explain these, these words, then you have to rely on the Arabic language and you have a m many layers of meaning for a particular word. That's yeah, how layers. rich the Arabic language is. So how do you know? That's how rich the tiramisu is. <laughs> This is the meaning that is intended by God. You're basically digging yourself into a hole as well, because what you're saying is if science changes in 10 years time regarding a, a, a scientific fact which you say is in the Quran, then what are you going to do? You're stuck. Exactly. Imagine the 19th century Muslim you go. used this narrative. Yeah. The scientific fact of the time was steady state theory, the universe didn't begin. But the Quran says the universe began, the cosmos began. So yeah. what do they do? Reject the Quran or reject the science? Yeah. And this is why in the second show, we're going to give you a really robust method on how to show how the Quran is timeless yeah. and uh, how you can reconcile these issues in such an amazing, empowering way. Okay, excellent. Now, I think that, that in be itself is enough to make the point that we don't need to use the science. Um, it, th this ties into what um, AP was just saying. So, uh, didn't Muhammad explain any verse of all those scientific disasters? Uh, yes, he did in the Hadith, and they don't tend to go well for Muslims. So, like it, the, what the Quran says about embryology and so on. Muhammad expands upon it and says that, like, the semen stage. So, like, like in the Quran, it says he created you as a drop of fluid, um, uh, then, then turn that into a clot of blood, then turn that into a lump of flesh and so on, then made the flesh into bones, then clothed the bones and so on. It gets worse if you go to the Hadith because Muhammad gives a time frame. He says it's 40 days as, uh, as a sperm drop, then another 40 days as a blood clot and so on. He actually gives a time, and it's completely insane. It's completely ridiculous. He has no clue what he's talking about. Uh, likewise, with the, uh, the sun setting in a muddy pool, uh, the sun setting in a muddy pool, 
you have multiple hadith on this. So Muslims have to actually like pick and choose which hadith they're going to, because in Sunan Abu Daud, Muhammad says that uh, he's, he's not even talking about the Quran verse. He's just asking one of his companions. He says, where does the sun sunset? And the guy says, you know, you're the prophet. And he says, ah, it's going to set in a, in a pool. And so Muhammad says that it's in a pool, but you have these other hadiths where it goes under the throne of Allah and so on. So, so notice you have to, you have to reject the claim that the sun sets in a pool because you're interpreting the Quran as not meaning that. But Muhammad says in Sunan Abu Dawud, that's exactly what it means. The sun sets in a pool, but you can't believe that. So you have to dismiss that passage and just go with the passages where he says that the, the, you know, the, uh, the sun goes under Allah's throne. But that's not exactly helpful. It's not like you like you go out and, f and find that. It's just it's more mysterious as to what he means. So they're retreating to the, the more mysterious interpretation as opposed to the obvious uh, literal interpretation, which would be wrong. This is true. Like uh, Muhammad, for example, um, he made the mistake uh, of, of doing that in the past. Uh, he should have like he could take uh, Hamza Tortis's advice here. Uh, he was he was not very very smart about that whole thing uh he just interpreted things based on his time and then made such ridiculous assertions about the world around us because that's what the science in his time said if muhammad if the prophet muhammad listened to hamza sources he would come to better conclusions yes hamza we want you to use science to build a time machine go back in time slap muhammad in the mouth and tell him to get the stuff right <laughs> Right. <laughs> miracles approach. However, the next thing I want to move on to. Face trees like Sheikh Akram Nadwi, <clears throat> may Allah preserve him. He says, "Don't bring things to the Quran. Let the Quran speak for itself." Yeah. Like we 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 superimpose an empirical scientific paradigm with the Quran. How how do you know it's relating to an empirical paradigm? It could be a spiritual paradigm. Yeah. It could be an exist existential one. It could refer to so many different things. Allow the Quran to speak yeah. for itself. And you, there is a paper on this, which we're going to link to in the video description as well. It's an essay. Yeah, go and read yeah. further and study further. Sure. So the next thing I want to ask you uh, or touch upon is previous civilizations. Now, there is this there is this idea that we have as Muslims is that you know. The Prophet you know, the, he was the first one who mentioned some of these things. This, this knowledge wasn't present on the face of this earth before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's not true. So yeah. Ah, did you catch that? So this is why I said he he mentioned two reasons. He said one, science changes, so uh, you don't don't appeal to a scientific theory that might change at some point in the future. Um, and two, that hey, you have to know what Allah is actually saying. Don't just say oh, what Allah means here is this scientific theory when you don't know that's what Allah means. Uh, if you don't have Muhammad or someone uh, of authority telling you that that's what it means, then you run the risk of putting your own interpretation of these verses. But now is the third issue very important. Uh, suppose Muhammad says something and suppose he's, he's correct. How do you know he couldn't have known this ahead of time because other people have said it? And there is quite a bit of ignorance on what people knew before Muhammad or what theories were circulating during the time of Muhammad. Um, you, almost everything Muhammad says, you can find examples of it beforehand. You can find examples of it beforehand. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it's good that Hamza's pointing this out because this is a pretty significant problem here. So. He was the first one who mentioned some of these things. This, this knowledge wasn't present on the face of this earth before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's not true. It's not true. So yeah, exactly. That's the question. Yeah. So, so the question is, what you're saying, sir? I do want to. Well, I'll say the qu the question yeah. being that. <laughs> that's was, it, bro. Was this Be knowledge, assertive. Yeah, was this knowledge there before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Well, that's the point. No, it was, and that and it was. <laughs> He's pretty. He's saying, "Hey, any any of these any of these scientific issues where you say Muhammad got something right here, it's because other people were saying it ahead of time. I mean, not because because he would say, you know, that he's getting inspiration and so on. But what is there that you can point to that Muhammad actually got right that you can't find some by some group before Muhammad that was actually widely known when Muslims were traveling and so on? Like, what is there? How old is this video? It's several years old. Why? You have Muslims all around the internet still going around and saying, Muhammad, you know, he, the Quran tells us things that nobody knew at that time. They should just go back and watch this video from this guy who tells them that's nonsense, right? That's what, see, he, uh, Hamza is not nearly as good a popularizer as someone like uh, Ali Dawa. And that's why it's mm -hmm. good. That's why lots of people are hearing that this argument has been debunked 
from Ali Dawa and didn't hear it from Hamza. Um, Hamza is obviously significantly more intelligent, uh, a better speaker than Ali Dawa, pretty much better in every possible way, except Ali Dawa is just way more popular. And uh, so we're going to help Hamza. Ali Dawa is going to help Hamza. Everyone's going to help Hamza expose this ridiculous, stupid argument. And that's why we need to learn our history. And I, I'm quite saddened that we even wrote an essay about this a few years ago, did webinars and try to create a narrative. People still are not adopting this because they're still adopting a false historical narrative. Because people are saying, no one knew this information at the time in the 7th century. That's not true. I, I love how he just, it's not wow. true. Stop saying Thank it. You. It's false. Thank you. Thank I like you, this. I'm, I'm liking this guy, man. And you know what's amazing? There are Muslims who will be mad at him for destroying a completely deceptive, bogus argument. Whereas we're the reverse. It's like, I will take this guy more seriously than I will take someone who's still clinging to this argument, even though it's been debunked. So guys, you, you're actually better off in the long run if we think you're you're at least trying to be honest. When I see Zucker Nike, all I think is this is the biggest liar I've ever seen in my life. He has to know. He has to know that he's lying right now. There's no way he doesn't. Uh, this, it looks, it makes me think, even though I, I'm not going to agree with other arguments he may have for Islam, at least it, it appears that he's trying to be honest. Give you some examples. Consider the setting down of iron in the Quran in chapter 57, verse 25. The Quran says, and we sent down iron. Yes, this is relatively true that in some meteorites, you have iron ore, right? So iron was sent down from that perspective. Does that mean it's a scientific miracle? No, because no. you had the ancient Egyptians 1400 years before the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom he peace, they described iron as ba en pet, which means iron from heaven. Right. This was like over a thousand years before the Prophet So you could- um, This is an example of an argument where there are actually multiple problems yeah. with it and, and multiple problems that he uh, has already mentioned. So he mentions a problem of if you say, if you interpret the Quran as saying that iron is sent down from heaven and, oh, iron did come down in the form of meteorites and so on, uh, how could Muhammad have known this? Well, a bunch of people already knew that. They knew that meteorites have some sort of awesome metal that you could use to make really good weapons. And it's because mm -hmm. before before people knew how to get iron out of the ground, they would get it from meteorites. So a meteor, you see a meteorite fall and you go check it out and, oh, it's made of this awesome metal that was known, that was understood long before Muhammad. So even if the Quran, when it says sent down, is referring to it, keep in mind, all it says is uh, it was sent down. Iron was sent down. What does sent down mean? Uh, suppose you interpret it as sent down from outer space. Then, okay, other people knew that. That's what he's saying. If you're saying it's a miracle that Muhammad knew this, great. Bunch, a bunch of uh, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, they knew this, right? So that's one problem. The other problem is going back to what he was saying earlier, that one, you, you have to, you have, to a have an accurate understanding of what the Quran is saying, because sometimes it sounds like literally sent down from the sky, and other times it sounds like it's, it's a, it, he's using it as a synonym for, for saying, uh, like, Allah provided this for you. So example, uh, here are examples. Here are things, I made a list of things the Quran says Allah sent down. Allah sent down cattle. Um, where'd my list go? Oh, Allah sent down... According to the Quran, there are Quran verses on all of these things that Allah sent down. Allah sent down the balance. Allah sent down rain. Allah sent down manna. Allah sent down quails. Allah sent down cattle. Allah sent down clothing. Allah sent down the Torah. Allah sent down a surah. Allah sent down tranquility. Allah sent down angels. Allah sent down light. Allah sent down food. Allah sent down punishment. And of course, Allah sent down iron. So when, Allah, when it says Allah sent down iron, and you say, ah, that means he sent it down from outer space. Okay, it also says Allah sent down cattle. Does that mean he sent them down from outer space? How are you distinguishing? You're saying- I made a video about this, uh, yeah. where I listed those things as well and addressed the same point. Where I also took your advice and I depicted a cow falling from the sky. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> cow coming from outer space, yeah. 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 So notice this is, a, this is an argument that you still, you again, walk up to a dawah table, look at their materials there. You're going to find, oh my goodness, it's a miracle. No one could have possibly known that, a lot, that iron was sent down from, out, that iron came down in the form of meteorites from outer space and so on. And uh, yeah, take a closer look at that. One, they did know that. And two, it's not even clear that that's what the Quran is talking about. Yeah. So Precisely. bad Precisely. argument. 
hats off to Hamza for admitting there's a stupid, dumb argument. I don't claim miraculousness here. Yeah. We're not saying the Quran is wrong. We're not saying the Quran borrowed from these civilizations. No. Right. Okay, because the Quran, as we're going to discuss next week, uses words that have different layers of meaning that addresses different Jeremy. civilizations, different understandings. Cool. Because the whole point of these verses is for them to conclude, for us to conclude that God deserves worship. Hmm. So he wants a 7th century man to think about space in a 7th century way, to think about nature in a 7th century way. By the way, are you catching this? Because this is his position on what the science is actually saying. Guys, keep... And I have to say, this is way better than these scientific miracles. He's saying what Allah is actually saying in these passages where he's talking about, you know, iron and this and that is he's trying to inspire awe and wonder and gratitude in you. Right. Here's the problem, though. Um, the problem is that uh, he says that, and I understand why he says that, but in a lot of the, the verses in the Quran, it, um, it uses these the things that you can observe uh, in nature as a sign that uh, that that there is actually that Allah actually created everything and that you are supposed to worship Him. For example, it says, uh, "And do they not see the sky and there is no crack in it and stuff like that?" So it it actually does directly appeal to to science, to the natural world around us, tells people to uh, to observe it and to then conclude, "Oh yeah, this is telling the truth. This is from Allah. He created this." So. You know, there, there, there is an appeal to, to science. There is an appeal to scientific miracles. It, it is built into the Quran. And yeah, that's problematic. Hey, P, once again, be a nitpicky, but let's let <laughs> actual philosophers of science explain it. Quran, as we're going to discuss next week, uses words that have different layers of meaning that addresses different civilizations different understandings cool. because the whole point of these verses is for them to conclude for us to conclude that god deserves worship hmm. so he wants a seventh century man to think about space in a seventh century way to think about nature in a seventh century way to conclude that god deserves to be worshipped yeah. but the quran is so timeless that it does it in such a, an amazing way and we're going to discuss this next week yeah, well, that's going to be very powerful Th this is kind of a problem for what he's saying he's saying yeah that the Quran is written so that a 7th century man, who might believe that the sky is a solid object that would fall on us if Allah wasn't holding it up, um, that it's meant to appeal to him saying, hey, you know, isn't this amazing? You should be in awe of God for holding up the sky from, from falling on you. But simultaneously saying, ah, but it's timeless. And so, yeah, let's see where he's going with this. This is, this is uh, actually, um, uh, I'm... It's funny to hear this because this is exactly what Muhammad Hijab told me when he had a conversation with me, uh, where he was, uh, where he said that my uh, my 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 interpretations that the Quran has scientific uh, mistakes is a wrong understanding of the Quran, and even if I appeal to uh, to Muslim scholars, who uh, in the early times of Islam understood those things. Uh, as the Quran says it, and thereby promoted scientifically wrong ideas, I'm still wrong because the Quran, in its nature, is has an uh, an inter. Uh, it it appeals to all cultures and says uh, and, and makes statements about the natural world around us in in in, in such a way that it's miraculously. Uh, encompassing and appealing to everybody on the planet. So yes, somebody in the seventh century or in the eighth century might understand that the Quran says the earth, the, the, the sky is literally being held up. Uh, but it's okay. He is right in thinking that. But the one who nowadays says no, that's not what the Quran says, is also right because that is the miracle of the Quran. And that is just, I think, that is just very strange self history here. It's just. It just immediately gives me the thought, okay, but can I or another skeptic uh, not say, I'm, I'm reading this book and I see that it describes the world in a very ignorant way, just as many other ignorant people understand it. Therefore, I conclude that this book is a book of ignorance and I don't believe in it. If you can you know, <laughs> approach it uh, with with a positive uh, spirit by appealing to that whole whole logic, then you can also uh, just as well discard it or and dis disregard it and uh, consider it scientifically false. And this is why AP is clearly one of the worst of creatures.
Absolutely. You Absolutely. see, you see those gym, those mental gymnastics he did <laughs> to resist this powerful, powerful, powerful miracle. <laughs> I don't know what the point of this was. Uh, and I said, uh, look at the link in this live. The original video is there. Yeah. Oh, was, is, is he responding to someone about, hey, where's the original video? Yeah. The link oh, to yeah. the original video. In other words, the link to Hamza's video is in the description box. Yes, I put it there for anyone who wants, even though we're going through the entire video. Um, I put that there for anyone who wants to go check it out without the abusive commentary from AP. Sure. Oh, another example. So there's more examples. The moon being a broad light. The Quran says in chapter 10, verse 5, it is he who made the sun a shining light and a moon a derived light. Nuran no, means derived no, light. Now let's no, ignore how false, the word false. shining light. You seem false. to have some strong is, feelings about this, AP. That is completely false. That is entirely false. The Quran does not say such a thing. It does not say that it, that the moon is a derived light. The Quran literally says that the sun is a a, 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 a light and the moon is a nur and nur does not mean derived light it's simply it is simply uh it is simply again light where the word used for the sun is a bright shining light like a torch or a fire and uh and and the moon it's it's it, uh, when it says nur it refers to a different form of, of light which is like uh, softer it cannot be derived light which no dictionary says and which uh is simply untrue because if we did accept that uh, that nur means derived light, which is why the Quran allegedly uh, says that the moon has a derived light, then this would mean um, that the Quran also calls Allah himself a, a derived light because it refers to Allah as uh, as nur. It also refers to Muhammad as nur. We would say that that is also a derived light. And would you, do we really want to assert and accept that the Quran describes Allah as a derived light? What would that mean? And how would that possibly make sense? Uh, I don't think it would make sense. But why are you refuting an argument that he is about to say has been refuted? I don't know. He's agreeing with you, AP. He's agreeing. Really? But he's actually using this as an example of you can't say that Muhammad couldn't have known this. Okay, but but he but he's still yeah, saying so you, that, you, that the yeah, Quran you, does say it, it's, it's you, right. Yeah, you went. In a, you're going in a different direction. This is why it's funny because all, these arguments all have multiple problems. So it it will have a, a scientific problem, and it will have a does, is that what the Quran is really saying? So you're pointing out is that is that what the Quran is really saying? He's going to point out yeah. that people people before Muhammad all, already understood that the that the moon is reflecting the sun's light. Yeah, the pro so, my problem with it is is even when he explains why is it why it is wrong, he still uh, states a false fact, which I just feel like correcting. And that's what we call nitpicking. Yes, exactly. Being a broad light, the Quran says in chapter ten, verse five, "It is He who made the sun a shining light and a moon a derived light." Nuran means derived light. Now let's ignore how. The word shining light and nuran are interchangeable in the Quran. Let's ignore that for a minute. Let's just stick to, stick to the topic that oh, some okay. Muslims use this word nuran to show that the moon doesn't have its own light because it reflects the light of the sun. Because nuran means like a borrowed light. Yes, that's true. But 500 years BC, 1200 years before the prophethood, before the Quranic revelation, Thales said the moon is light from the sun. Another Greek, Anaxagoras, in around the same period, he asserted the moon doesn't have its own light, but light from the sun. What about, for example, the Big Bang? The Quran says in chapter 21, verse 30, Have not those who disbelieve known that the heavens and the earth were one piece? Then we parted them. Yes, it's very ambiguous. We don't know the howness and the kind of intricate details. That's not the point of this verse. The point is to, to for us to be in, in awe and for us to say that God deserves to be worshipped. But this doesn't really refer to the Big Bang because what Big Bang? There are so, um, I think I've made a video about this. So what's he talking about, sir? Uh, uh, 21 verse 30, where if you actually read it, this was called like the cosmic egg theory, <laughs> right? Like... <laughs> Like the earth, it's amazing because um, the Quran talks about the earth and the heavens being one thing, and then it it uh, it like uh, it separates. That's called this cosmic egg theory that everything was at one point one, and then it it uh, it uh, it separates. And so the point to that, see, that's the Big Bang. 
Okay, if that's the Big Bang, it says the Earth was there at the Big Bang. Well, what's what scientists, you, you could say you believe it or something like that, but if you're saying confirmed by science, a scientific miracle, miraculous scientific knowledge that a scientist today would confirm, uh, they're not going to say that the Earth uh, exploded out of the Big Bang back then. You, it's just not going to say that. Um, so is this an accurate description? Awesome. Yeah, it's it's Earth and heaven together in an, in like an egg form, and then it gets separated Earth from heaven. Is that the Big Bang Theory? No, it's not. Be honest. If you want to say you believe it, believe it. But if don't say that this is uh, confirmed by science. This uh, is so very Islamophobic. Let's back up a little bit. You're Islamophobic. Uh, somebody here said, uh, some genius here, uh, somebody here said, Mar some, somebody with the name Martin something, I think, I don't know, said, it actually does mean derived light or Michael Hilton, nor does mean derived light. It doesn't, it doesn't. I will, I want to read you um, a Quran verse uh, very quickly here. Quran chapter 24, verse 35. And uh, it says, Allah is the nur of the heavens and the earth. Let me let me read this uh, as derived light here. Allah is the derived light of the heavens and the earth. The examples of his derived light is like a niche within which uh, a niche and so on. Do you think it makes sense to describe Allah as a derived light? What is it derived from? What is Allah derived from? Does it mean Allah takes his own light from something else? Does it mean Allah depends on something? Does it mean that there was something before Allah, which he takes his energy and his light from? Really curious. All right. We got some problems here that Allah is. Yeah, I mean, I guess this would tie in. Uh, if Allah prays for Muhammad, as Muhammad Hijab says, if Allah prays for Muhammad, the question is who he's praying to. Maybe he's praying to the source of the light that he derives. Maybe. That makes sense. See? Yeah, there, so there's some greater, sense. greater thing than Allah, and he derives light from that. And there's notice, someone... notice the problem, because this is always the problem. This is always, always, always the problem in Dawah. Let me give you an example. It's it's like citing things and not actually stopping to pay any attention whatsoever to what's actually being said. So look at this. <laughs> this is this is this is actually just an example, ladies and gentlemen. I want to give you an example of Muslim da'is will run around with a claim like this. Look, you see, Jesus uh, is Muslim. He prayed like one. It's amazing. L look at what. So he points to Matthew twenty six thirty nine. What happens if you actually read the verse? <laughs> Going a little farther, he fell down with his face to the ground and prayed, "My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will." Is that how Muslims pray? They they call God Father, because according to the Quran, Allah's a father to no one. So is is Jesus praying like a Muslim here? Is that what he's doing? Like, I mean, how how how, how does this happen? I don't know. Uh, but let's go. Well, one the Quran piece, is even then angry about them. What? being called the Quran in the Quran. Allah is even angry about being called a father by the or by 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 Christians and Jews saying we are the children of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Allah's a father to no one. He says there's no one who comes to him as anything other than a slave. And Muslims say, look, Jesus prays just like us. Really? He just recites these, you know, he recites these phrases in Arabic and so on. No, 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 it. not that part. Not that part. Only the first part. Only the part where he completely <laughs> contradicts Islamic theology. <laughs> yes, it's very ambiguous. We don't know the howness and the kind of intricate details. That's not the point of this verse. The point is to, to for us to be in, in awe and for us to say that God deserves to be worshipped. But... This doesn't really refer to the Big Bang, because what Big Bang? There are 20 different models, more than 20 models, may, may, maybe. The, also, the quantum fluctuation model, oscillation model, the Friedman Lemaitre model, all these. You can go with any model. It does not line up with what the Quran says. Pick a model. It doesn't yeah. line up. So that's so yeah. stop saying that the Quran is confirmed by anything remotely resembling modern cosmology. Because what model are we choosing here? And these are not even hardcore facts in science anyway. And not even that, you have Sumerian literature in the Epic of Gilgamesh that reflects this kind of narrative. That's this cosmic It says when the heavens had been separated from the earth, when the earth had been delimited from the heavens, when the fame of mankind had been established. And the Quran says when the heavens and the earth were one piece and we parted them. Similar kind of narrative. Doesn't mean the Quran you know copied, doesn't mean the Quran borrowed. Notice, heavens and earth were one piece. Then at yeah. the creation, Allah separates them. Is that any version of the Big Bang Theory? No. That the earth was already there. I actually appreciate really what he's what he's doing here. Um, 
it, it's good that he's pointing out that this is uh, not, you know, in alignment with with how uh, with with the with the theory of evolution as we know it. But the other thing is uh, when he points out that this that the that the Sumerians um, had a similar narrative. Uh, I actually use this to point out that the Quran uh, has a scientific mistake and that it simply borrows uh, the cosmology or cosmogony from um, from ancient understandings and ancient tales because the Quran specifically yeah describes the whole issue as uh, there is water um, and then Allah just creates uh, creates the earth puts it on onto the water then he uh, builds the heaven and he makes it seven heavens and so on and this is uh, a narrative that is also quite uh, found in Sumerian cosmology and in many other uh, pre-Islamic cultures and mythologies, which describe that that there was only this uh, primordial water, and then and, th- and then the gods put uh, an earth on top of it, and then establish seven heavens or more heavens or and and more earths, which is also confirmed in the Quran. Um, in fact, what the Quran describes, the way the Quran describes the sequences of creation of the universe, uh, of the world, um, I don't even want to say universe, uh, is in no way. Is in no way in agreement with any of the already known facts that we have about the universe. Uh, even if you want to leave it open and say the theory of um, you know that the Big Bang theory might change in the future, it doesn't even matter. The Quran is already wrong about the sequence of the Earth, the Earth and the the heavens, as you want to call them. It is a scientific mistake. Or you're wrong, bigot. Science changes. <laughs> but. You can't claim miraculousness here because it was already known by primitive civilizations. Does it mean it's wrong? No. But what it does mean, though, is yes. we is. shouldn't read too many things into Quran, allow the Quran to speak for itself, which we're going to discuss next week. Okay, so another question that follows on from this is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, well, there's this idea that's out there that he couldn't have had access to this information from other civilizations. No way he could have had this access. He, he, he wasn't learned, he didn't have, uh, he wasn't around other civilizations and so on and so forth. We know this isn't the case. Is that correct? I'm confused by this guy asking the question because it's exactly what Hamza just said. Hamza gave multiple examples of people knowing things before <laughs> Muhammad. And then after all that, the guy says, oh, okay, so let's talk about whether Muhammad could have known stuff in the Quran ahead of time by other people. I don't know. Is he just going to recap? I don't know. Let's see. Yes, the, the the assertion is wrong. They can't claim, oh, even if there was an accurate primitive understanding of science at that time available, the Prophet Muhammad upon him couldn't have accessed it at all. Yeah. Again, I'm sorry, this is this is this is false. It denies established history of Arabia and it denies the prophetic traditions are authentic. For example, in Sahih Muslim, which is an authentic compilation of the prophetic traditions, the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, he actually took medical knowledge from the Romans and Persians. Uh-huh. Yes. Which yes. shows to us a beautiful teaching that when it comes to medicine and the sciences, and there are all these situations where Muhammad's like, ah, I'm going to I was about to say one thing, but then I saw from the Romans something else and i went with the romans you must share knowledge with your fellow human being this is beautiful it encourages the kind of cultivation of the sciences and the, and the and the kind of sharing of knowledge for example and i'm going to quote the hadith for you the prophetic tradition for you directly the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said i intended to prohibit cohabitation with the suckling women but i considered the roman and, and persians and i saw that they suckle their children and this thing meaning the cohabitation does not do any harm to them this is an authentic tradition which shows that the Prophet ﷺ had knowledge of other civilizations, namely the Romans and the Persians. Also, okay. also we have- I want to say something very briefly. If I was a Muslim and I listened to a preacher or somebody uh, cite or quote this, it would immediately raise some flags. And I would think, wait a minute. He wanted to do what? He wanted to prohibit it? And... I will, I will, I will accept for once that maybe uh, I was just approaching these things with a little bit of a more deeply questioning um, mind than most people do. <laughs> yeah, I actually want to go through all the hadiths and just find the ones where Muhammad changes his mind based on what the Jews or the Romans do. 
He's like, yeah. oh, okay, it works for them. Okay, we'll we'll go with that then. We'll go with that thing. And it's like, wait a because minute. Because you see this, this is, example. Yeah, it's go ahead. over and over again. It's over and over again in the Muslim sources where, hey, I'm going to do this, and this is going to be the rule that we're all going to follow. And then, hey, Muhammad, what about the Romans over there? They, uh, they have the opposite teaching. Oh, let's go with the Romans then. And it's like, wait, this is how this guy's coming up with his uh, his rulings on all these things. And it notice, if he hadn't changed his mind based on what the Romans are, or the Jews are doing in some situation, that other thing would have still would have still been the rule in Islam. And they would take this as Allah's divine stamp of approval on this practice when Muhammad's yes. like figuring this out as he goes along. Not according to us, according to, the, according to the Muslim sources, Muhammad is uh, coming to these conclusions based on hearing what other people are doing and so on. Precisely. And, and, and this by is, the way, uh, oh, go ahead. No, this is, this is just clear proof from Muslim sources themselves, from authentic sources, that Muhammad... Um, arbitrarily makes rules as he goes from what he observes and it's not from some from some divine wisdom it is arbitrary from his observations um yeah it's weird but i mean here again i like i like that he's going in a better direction with it because what he what he just said would be the takeaway message of muhammad changing his mind in light of other uh, cultures and so on is now you've presented the problem that this is how he's coming up with his rulings and so on. It means that it doesn't sound like his rulings are coming from God. It sounds like he's just picking and choosing what he likes uh, best or what he thinks is the best, and he's getting information as it comes in and so on. So this questions it, it that particular that specific example wouldn't call into question like the Quran. You could still say, hey, yeah, Muhammad's figuring things out, but the Quran is the perfect word, the perfect speech of Allah. But Muslims also take everything Muhammad did as like, oh, this is the way. Oh, that's how Muhammad walked into the bathroom. That's how we have to step into the bathroom. That's how Muhammad peed. That's how we have to pee. That's what they they take all this. So if he's just coming up with this as he goes along based on other practices that he's witnessing, you shouldn't be overemphasizing that stuff too much because it's just yeah. it, it doesn't look like it has God's stamp of approval. Look, look, look at this dumb comment. Ranzo says, uh, what you Christians have done is overpraise a messenger of Allah. This is how Christianity started. Uh, Ranzo. It's Allah's fault. Yeah, uh, Ranzo. Um, Allah overpraised Jesus, right? So Allah gives Jesus a miraculous birth. Allah gives Jesus the most miraculous life in history. Allah makes Jesus the Messiah. They want to, tons of prophets killed in the Muslim sources. Um, Muhammad's even killed in the Muslim sources, but Allah wouldn't allow it to happen to Jesus. He miraculously saves him. Um, and other prophets are sinless except Jesus. So why is Jesus so radically different from everyone else? If you want to know why Christians uh, came up with the understanding that that Jesus is more than just a prophet, you you should uh, be condemning Muhammad. I mean, condemning Allah right now for making Jesus so radically different from every other prophet. So what you're yeah. telling us is Allah screwed up by making Jesus so uh, so incredibly unique. I, I want to make it very simple. You are in a culture where people believe that only God can uh, breathe life into uh, lifeless beings; that only God can, um, you know, give life or raise people. Uh, plus, you are in a culture where people um, have learned this idea that if somebody is born without uh, without father, um, then that means that implies divine origin, right? So, uh, divi uh, divine divine fatherhood. And in that culture, a prophet comes into existence without father from a virgin and also in their life raises people from the dead and even according to the Quran itself, breathes life into lifeless beings. Do you think it is uh, people's fault for thinking that he is God? Yeah, so yeah, blame your, blame your God there, Ranzo. Uh, and, and you even pointed out, uh, so so Jesus is also called the word of Allah. So Allah speaks out his word, and he's called a spirit from Allah. So notice, I mean, when Allah creates something, he says, be, and the thing comes into existence. But Jesus somehow originates from within Allah. Everything is a, everything is a very, very different from what you would expect. But isn't it funny? Isn't it funny a guy's... <laughs> It's always funny. You're overemphasizing a prophet 
wait, Muslims are telling us we're overemphasizing a prophet. (laughs) The guys who speak directly to Muhammad during their prayers, we're the ones, the the guys who will murder people in the streets for making a cartoon or or mocking this guy. They're the, we're the ones overemphasizing a prophet. Seriously. Um, All right. To understand that there was an exchange of cultures at yeah. the time. Look at the trading that they'll go to China to trade. What do you think they went? They went for a teleportation system, <laughs> vowed months of silence, and then picked uh, the goods and went back without speaking to anybody? No, they went on like horse and camel and goat, and they would exchange they cultures. And do people ride goats? <laughs> do they? I mean, that that would be news to me. I, I just didn't. I didn't know you could ride a goat. I don't think so. I don't know. He said that, it. He that, said that, they're on horses like and torture. He said they were on horses and camels and goats. Guys, be nice. Don't ride a goat. They're too small. Discuss. And this is why we even have... Plus, it's a big goat. ...concepts of linguistic borrowing. Cultures share different languages because... Maybe, maybe he wasn't talking about inter- actually riding it. So I don't know. Maybe he was using riding in a different way. I don't know. Change of culture. You have, to, you have to know what he's saying and have some, some accurate commentary on it. So the point here is, it's, it's highly bizarre for us to make such a claim that he could have access to this knowledge. That's not true. Especially when in Egypt, in around, I think, the 6th century, they already had, in Alexandria, I believe, translations of Greek medical documents. Yeah. I mean, it's not that far. They went to China, forget Egypt, yeah? yeah? So, to make such a claim denies our own Islamic history, and it denies the prophetic traditions. And for example, if you look at the historian Ira M. Lapidus in his book, A History of Islamic Society, summarizes this. He says, by the mid-6th century, as heir to Petra and Palmyra, Mecca became one of the important caravan cities of the Middle East. The Meccans carried spices, leather, drugs, cloth, and slaves, which had come from Africa or the Far East to Syria, and returned returned money, weapons, cereals, and wine to Arabia. So he's saying, and there's some question about the historical accuracy of the Muslim position of Mecca being this super important uh, trade center. Um, you know, people like Robert Spencer and uh, Jay Smith will point out that it's not you don't find it on any of the ancient trade maps and so on. But supposing yeah. we grant the standard Muslim perspective, the standard Muslim perspective is that Mecca is this hub of trade. And so that's why you got the caravans going all over the place all the time. If you've got caravans going all over the place all the time and so on, then that means travelers are pretty regularly coming to you and that you're actually traveling as well. Muhammad was a caravan trader before he was a caravan robber. Um, so the idea that Muhammad and his followers are not going to uh, ever encounter, you know, the thoughts of Hippocrates or Galen or something like that, it, it's kind of a, it's kind of beyond silly. Of course, they're going to come into contact with all of it, especially when one of the main accusations of the unbelievers in the Quran over and over again, like a beating drum is, Muhammad is just hearing what other people are telling him. Look, Muhammad is, is just hearing what this other guy tells him. And then he comes up with this as a revelation. What are you grinning at? Um, I think um, that's actually a very interesting perspective that he is uh, addressing, which I never really thought about before. <laughs> that uh, that it doesn't make sense to combine these two ideas, that... Uh, that Mecca is such a such a giant place visited by everyone, which is obviously false. And then also, Muhammad could have couldn't have known any of this because there was nothing going on in his time. But yeah, I'm I was I'm actually grinning about the whole comments on riding goats. So. Yeah, I know. This <laughs> I think it's like riding a horse, but it's a goat instead. <laughs> <laughs> goat riders in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, there's a bunch of these. I can't even post all these. There's too many of them. <laughs> someone, know, saying, someone says that the camel was the goat, as in greatest of all time. So if you're riding yeah. the greatest camel of all time, you're riding the, the greatest of all time. Okay, excellent. So I think you've summed that up very, very good. I think it's very clear that, you know, we shouldn't be arguing scientific miracles in the Quran. It's not the right approach. We shouldn't be doing that. Oh, did you catch that? No. He just said it. It's clear. Stop arguing for scientific miracles in the Quran. Stop it. It's the wrong approach. I don't believe he said that. I don't believe it for a second. It's pretty It's pretty awesome. I mean, given like Ahmed Didad and Zakir Naik going all in on the scientific miracles, then to just have these guys come along a few years later. Ah, it's all a lie. There the are same, many more miracles we could of course, talk about. And at the same time... We- Zakir Naik wrote a huge book about this, about scientific miracles. Powerful. A gi- giant book about scientific miracles. Super powerful. Yeah. 
AP. Yes. You want me to build you a bookshelf, man? Because <laughs> I don't, I, I don't <laughs> like bookshelf. <laughs> it's just got stacks of books. All right. I actually have a bookshelf right there, uh, within arm's reach. But uh, in order for it to be really within arm's reach, I would have to slightly stand up and then reach over. I, I don't want to do that. That's why I put them all here on my desk instead. Yeah. I'm a build your bookshelf. To really emphasize that as Muslims, yes, we know that the Quran is revealed to the Prophet It came from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Everything it contains is from Allah, and it's, tr it's the truth. It's accurate, and so on and so forth. But what we're saying is, don't impose narratives onto the Quran itself, right? Yeah, and so don't there's use also a another point, David. Uh, there's also another point of which, which I think very important to add here for the context. I also I put these books here just to show off. Mm -hmm. That's what books are for. Oh no, so. I get that. That's why everyone has books in their background. You can put anything in your background, but you put something in the background to make you look smart, right? Yeah, that's what we all do. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, that's, that's what everyone does. Thinks. Everyone does that. Yeah. Methodology, because as we discussed, science is transient, is time bound, and using a time bound, limited, transient methodology to prove something that you yeah. believe is timeless. Yeah, that's the most. Powerful. It's flawed, absolutely, and there's nothing wrong with something currently now scientifically contradicting the Quran. Yeah. Big deal. Where has science come from? Understand its philosophy, its method, how scientists derive knowledge from empirical data. Yeah. And if you understand that, you see, well, you might change. Next week, they might say they may say this. In one month, this. In one year, this. Yeah. And next month, they might say that the sun does indeed set in a muddy pool. Because that's how science, that's because science changes. You've seen this when you look into the history of science, right? Take even evolution. Evolution has evolved as well yeah. in terms of the scientists understanding what evolution is from that perspective. So we need to relax and take a yeah. chill pull. However, the reason we're... Chill pull? I think he's trying to say chill, <laughs> chill pill. <laughs> yeah, stop Did they say chill pull? <laughs> <laughs> Take even evolution. Evolution has evolved as well yeah. in terms of the scientists understanding what evolution is from that perspective. So we need to relax and take a yeah. chill pull. However, <laughs> the reason we're we're adamant in, in, in producing this narrative is because we need to change the narratives in the dawah in calling people to Islam because frankly it has created a lot of doubts and it's created a lot of what I call apostasies because people have left the religion of uh -huh. Islam because the only thing we gave them was scientific miracles. Yeah. That's a huge point. It's a, I, we've, been, we've been saying this for years. I always say when these guys come out with their new, their great new dawah thing, it's always short-term gain, long-term loss. Yes, it will help you. In that. Clinging to Andrew Tate and using his popular sneak out, doing that for a brief amount of time, gives you a, a it, you can use that for a short amount of time. You can use someone like Sneak or Andrew Tate uh, to, you know, for video purposes or something like that, to get a brief burst of attention. It Long-term, it's not going to work out for you. It's, gonna, it's, a, it's a disaster long-term. And so, you know, this... Uh, Quran's been perfectly preserved. Every single manuscript everywhere is a miracle. That worked for a while, as long as you had an, atmos an atmosphere of complete ignorance. And you can make that argument, which is stupid on multiple levels and completely ridiculous. Um, but they went with that. Okay, now what happens when people find out the Quran hasn't been perfectly preserved? Now you've got the science stuff, right? They went with that for a while. And then, oh, now they find out that the that it's all bogus. And what are you guys getting with all of What's the result of all this? The, what you call the avalanche of apostasy. That's the result. Um, because all the reasons you're giving people for thinking that the Quran is true, you admit later on was all a lie. Yeah. Weird. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. They understood what science was and they understood that actually, you know what? There was knowledge at the time. There was exchange of cultures. It decreases the so-called miracle claim. Yeah. Now, I had a conversation with a student of knowledge saying, yeah, but I knew this Arab speaker, he did the linguistic analysis and it was amazing. And it correlated to what the scientists are saying now. I'm like, wow. And I just said one thing. The reason you find it so amazing, because you already have Iman, you already have faith that you know it's from Allah. Oh. Yeah. Give them that basis first. Biased. And then you could talk about these yeah. things if you want from a tadabur pondering perspective. But you that, that's very important what he just said right there. Uh, why do you believe that this, why are you going with this understanding of this verse that you think is somehow miraculously confirmed by modern science? Why are you seeing that as something powerful? You already believe that it is from God and you're looking for that. You're looking for it. True words. And, you're, True and when words someone said, and when someone said, but this is, I mean, keep in mind, this is a problem because what you see over and over again, a Dawah guy can come along and say absolutely anything. 
no matter how false, no matter how ridiculous, and they will just rally around it. And that will be their new argument. And so Hamza's pointing out this, guys, it's actually a problem that you just, anything, anyone comes up, anyone comes up to you with and says, hey, this is a, this is a miracle of Islam. And they'll go, oh, Alhamdulillah. And they side with it because it's on their side, rather than saying, okay, we are Muslims, but we still want to be careful about arguments and make sure that we have good arguments. Um, it's just, yeah. oh, if it's in support of us, we will accept it. And that's a, that's a bad methodology. Anyone can use that methodology. Anyone could say, hey, I'm, if it agrees with me and agrees with my position, then I'm just going to mindlessly accept it. Uh, but you should be a bit more critical than that. I think it's a miracle because I said, answer these two questions. Number one, is the science that you're trying to relate it to absolutely true? Can you prove that? Can you prove it won't change next year or in two years' time? Can you prove that we have all the number of observations we require for a particular phenomena to conclude that this is an absolute fact? No! You yes. can't even claim that about many things in science, yeah. right? Number two, the meaning you've chosen for that particular word in the verse in the Qur'an, is that the meaning intended by God? Yeah. How yes. can you prove such a thing? Because when you don't have the prophetic traditions to explain, you don't have ijma'a of the scholars, consensus of the scholars, and all the other bits and pieces that you require for understanding the Qur'an, then you have to rely on the Arabic language. Yeah. The Arabic language is very rich. It has many layers of meaning. Which one is the one intended by God? Yeah. Now, if you claim all of them are, then that would support our narrative, which we're going to discuss yeah. next week. And just to introduce the narrative before yeah. we end, which is very important, the narrative that we're going to talk about... <laughs> Check this out. It's funny, uh, Dr. Eggman here says science is haram, but it is. in the clip we watched from Ali, we didn't watch it here, but when we watched the full clip, what does he say? Didn't he say something like, to hell with science or something like that? When, <laughs> when <he's, laughs> yes. He says yeah. something like that. It's not science. We don't care about science. science to hell with science. <laughs> <laughs> this is the guy who is saying that the Quran is miraculously confirmed by the the seven ozone layers and then thinks, no, it's it's a, it turned out to be five ozone <laughs> Like, I, I was saying there are seven <laughs> ozone layers, but the other guy was saying there are six, six ozone, ozone layers. layers. And then we checked NASA website and they said there are five ozone layers. No, they didn't. You can't get <laughs> you can't get anything right. And this is the ch and he's the champion of Dawa. It's, I mean, the, it's literally his name. They named Dawa after Ali Dawa. That's how successful yeah. he is. And up, uh, yeah. oh, it's the seven, the seven. Uh, the seven ozone layers. It's beautiful. We're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're saying the Quran is multi-leveled and multi-layered. What does that mean? The there words used to describe natural phenomena or things that appear to be natural phenomena or science. These words have many layers of meaning. Layers. And these layers of meaning address different mindset civilizations across time. That's not the formal profound. It's very profound yeah. because the Quran doesn't have a language that represents a 7th century language. Yeah. It's a language that is timeless. Yes, there may be... This is so stupid. I mean... Arabic is a timeless <laughs> language. This is so stupid. Oh, boy. Arabic is just timeless. It's without... <laughs> it has always existed. It has never developed at all. Um, interesting. Some things that may be the only, unscientific. The only reason that uh, the only reason that that Arabs today or Arab spe speakers today uh, understand the Arabic of the Quran quite well is that uh, is that they have faithfully, religiously stuck to uh, you know preserving and going by the Arabic of the Quran. And even in that case, even in that case, the Arabic that people are uh, speaking nowadays. Even the classical, uh, even the, the 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 modern standard Arabic is quite quite different. Deviates quite from the classical Arabic, and the Arabic that people speak across different nations across the Arab world is also very uh, different from each other. Where somebody with uh, the average average Arabic speaking person would not really understand much of what the Quran is actually saying. Yeah, the, I've heard the general rule in Arabic is like, you uh, you know, Arab speakers in one country can generally understand the Arabic of the neighboring country. But, you know, if you mm -hmm. go two or three countries away, they don't understand each other. Uh, I would but, say I would say they still kind of understand like what is being said and the gist of it. But it's, it's it gets difficult in yeah. making out what is actually yeah being. Conveyed. Yeah, I've, I've heard problems with like uh, I've heard people like uh, he's from Morocco. We don't understand him. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, no, everything you're uh, AP, everything you just said is complete nonsense because Arab, Arabic is timeless. You just said it. Which part of Arabic Absolutely. is timeless didn't you understand? 
But those I are things are only to encourage us to do more science and do more investigation. Because the Quran is not a book of science, it's a book of science. Because the Quran, the main purpose of these verses is to show that, look, you came from a blood clot or something that looked quite bloody, right? Or look at the orbits, look at the celestial objects and they seem to be swimming in the universe, they're floating or whatever the case may be. That should give a 7th century desert Arab a sense of awe and wonder thinking, who has done this? Who created the physical causes in the universe to enable this to happen? He deserves to be worshipped. That's the conclusion, deserve to be worshipped. Yep. Not there's all these scientific miracles and details. It's not. The verses are quite ambiguous. Hey, re remember the video we watched in the beginning where the dude is saying, ah, he's not denying that the, he's not denying the scientific miracles argument. Just look it up. <laughs> Sounds an awful lot like he's denying the scientific miracles argument. I mean, if this is him Definitely. not, if this is him not denying the scientific miracles argument, my goodness. This is, this is, I mean, with, with, with a few exceptions, this is borderline exactly what I would say if I were criticizing the scientific miracles argument. Like I would use the exact same bullet points that he's using as far as problems with the argument. And yet you still got Muslims circulating. Oh, no, 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 no. Ali Dawa and, and, and uh, Hamza sources aren't saying that the argument has been debunked. They're just saying, you know, don't be too forceful with it. If believing in the scientific miracles was a uh, was a fundamental necessity of being part of a religion, this speech by Hamza Tortis would be complete blasphemy. That's how bad it is. But oh, no. yeah. Uh, uh, hey, check this out. Farid was doing yet another video refuting you today. That's Again? Good. That's a guy, wow. It seems like every day. I haven't seen I haven't seen some of his recent ones. But yeah, we'll get to you, Farid. We'll get to you when we're when we were bored one day and. Uh, we'll go through another Fareed video. I actually, I actually like that Fareed is actually uh, playing our videos and going through them and actually discussing them. Um, and, and I'm saying that because like probably 98% of the messages and comments I get from Muslims are just insults. So to have someone actually, and again, I don't, I don't care if you insult me, you can insult me, but it's good that in the, even as he's, you know, he'll toss in insults and so on, but it, he's at least responding to what we say. Um, so Wow, that, I'm looking cool at it right now. He actually made a stream in which he is responding to an age-old video from you where you sit down with Nabil and talk about the perfect preservation of the Quran. That's funny. Oh, that skit. You and me are planning on remaking that at some point, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but we might have a different ending where, where you actually burn it or something like that. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what we're thinking. <laughs> That'd be funny. Uh, all right. That perspective. Deliberately to make you think. The Quran wants you to think about the most profound conclusion that he deserves to be worshipped. Not that, you know, you have the embryological process in the Quran. That's not true. So we're going to discuss this new robust approach. And I think it allows the Quran to speak for itself. Yeah, we think... don't impose an empirical paradigm. And uh, I hope people listen to yeah, us. Yeah, I think it's been very profound. I think you've covered all the points very, very clearly. Uh, the next show is going to be a really, really amazing like show, you know, which is going to basically give you something instead, which is far more powerful, yes. like it. far more greater than anything else we've done previously regarding the scientific miracles. And it doesn't limit the Quran in any way. We're going to show how timeless the Quran is, how profound the Quran is. And the examples I'm, we're going to give you are going to be mind blowing. Yeah. Be idnillah, inshallah. So stick with us next week. Stay tuned, yeah. So Jazakallah here for watching. Hopefully this is beneficial. Please make sure to like the video, share the video, and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, Salaam Alaikum. Jazakallah, everyone. Jazakallah. All right, well, that was it. Um, yeah. And we watched. Black we, Angel is making nasty comments about people here. I wanted to, I wanted to make this, uh, I wanted to go through that specifically because. You've got all these Muslims who still believe in the scientific miracles and are trying to deny that these guys are actually saying the argument has been debunked. Ali, Ali Dawa can't possibly make himself, and I, well, he could make himself clearer if he didn't you know, say, oh, but we can still be amazed by <laughs> darkness in the water. How could anyone know that it's dark down there? Right, he, so <laughs> you know, the fact that he's even saying this is impressive is a concern. But uh, apart from that, I mean, how many different ways could he say the argument has been debunked? And then Hamza sources, I mean, he goes through it in order to have a successful argument from miraculous 
accuracy, miraculous scientific accuracy. One, you'd have to know that the science isn't going to change. Two, you'd have to know that the Quran is actually claiming what you're saying that it claims. And three, you'd have to know that Muhammad uh, couldn't have known this from people who came before him, even if he did get something right. What example in the Quran do you have that meets those criteria? What? What example meets those criteria in the Quran? in order to qualify as miraculous scientific knowledge. You don't have one. There isn't an example that meets those criteria. So if those are the criteria of a successful argument from scientific accuracy, Hamza Tsortsis is saying you don't have anything like that, so stop using it. I, I, it it's just amazing. You'll still have Muslims saying, no, 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 they're not saying it's been debunked. They're just saying, you know, don't be too aggressive with it. What's what's wrong? What's wrong with you guys? I'm talking about the Dawa the Dawa fanboys. Like, what's wrong with you guys? It's too powerful, know. you know. All right, it's too powerful. Well, we've been through it, man. We've been through it. Um, are you ready to convert to Islam, AP? Uh, yes, I will. I will do that tonight. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess. I don't know. Do, do we even still need to keep addressing the scientific? I mean, if they're saying it's been debunked and now Ali Dawa is popularizing the fact that it's been debunked, do we even need to keep responding to this stuff? I'm not sure. But uh, there is there is there is part of me that says you should keep going after the argument until it's completely dead and you don't even have people like in YouTube shorts defending it and saying, oh, Mike Jones doesn't know what he's talking about. Ali Dawa never said this. This has been debunked. Aladawa would never say that. He would never, never say that. No. Isn't it amazing, though? I mean, when you go through the history, which which Hamza did, when you go through the history of how people came up with this argument, like this, these schemes and plots involving terrorists to get some sort of confirmation for their book, and then people like Zakhar Naik, the biggest liars on the planet, spread this. And then when Muslims, Muslim Dawa guys finally say, hey, guys, stop using this. This is an embarrassment. This is only going to lead to more apostasy if you keep on this road. Then they say, oh, no, 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 they're not, they're not saying it's been debunked. It's like, you still want to cling to it. It's, these would be the same guys who would say, oh, there, it's true. There is only one Quran. There is only one Quran, no textual variance. Oh, uh, 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 Sheikh, Sheikh Yasser Qadi didn't say there are holes in the narrative. He didn't say that. He didn't say that at all. He never said that. That's not what he meant. He meant there are holes in the narrative of a particular scholar who had a wrong idea. Oh, boy, this is what we're dealing with. I actually find it um, commendable. I guess uh, it's 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 good that Hamza Tsortsis actually sits down and uh, and talks about this and basically gives a whole lecture or a speech about um, about how this narrative, which is used in order to convert people to Islam uh, unsuccessfully or to uh, reaffirm people's uh, people's uh, people's beliefs that this is actually a wrong thing because not, not many Muslims are doing this, but he actually chose to sit down and do that. So it's interesting. This isn't actually from your wife, right? <laughs> nope. This is somebody trying to insult me by giving you yeah, but why would, Canadian dollars. I don't why, would, why would someone be giving me money and saying I look young at 47 and be mocking you simultaneously? I don't get it. Because, I mean... As soon as they call you that, as soon as they call you that, it's like they're asking for us to insult Muhammad. But I can't even tell because he's handing me he's handing me two Canadian dollars, which is basically it's, ten cents. It might be a mental problem. That's yeah. That's what I was. I don't even know what the, I don't even know if I should start saying mean things about Muhammad because someone just called you a name. I don't know. No, I don't. Because I don't. I I, I I I want to ignore this because I think that this person is probably mentally challenged or something, mm -hmm. and I don't want to be you know too mean about that. So I will just I will just let it go. Yeah. All right, all right, guys. Well, for years, Zucker Nike lied to the Muslim community. Uh, his lies. He was a popularizer of lies that were uh, built up from lies of Dawa guys before him, people who uh, got money from Osama bin Laden to deceive mass numbers of people because they understood that there was this atmosphere of general ignorance about Islam. So if you could uh, get a scientist to say something, you could use that clip and say, you see, this is the proof of Islam. And they, they knew the guys who were doing this, the guys who were coming up with this scheme, they knew how deceptive this was. They did not care because the their methodology is whatever gets people to under, to to uh, convert to Islam or keeps Muslims confident of Islam is good. 
even if it's a lie. They ran with it. Ahmed Dida, Zakir Naik, they knew it was a lie. They did anyway. To be to to be fair, your average Muslim who says, "Ah, the Quran contains scientific miracles," probably doesn't know that that he's spout that he's spreading lies uh, because they trust their dawah guys. They trust their popularizers, um, and they trust them so much that even when another popularizer comes along and says, "Actually, that's been debunked," they'll still cling to the original liar who lied to them. This is very very strange. But now they're in the situation of uh, the lies have been exposed, and what do we do? And some of them are gonna. Some of them are going to go along with their new Dawa guy, Ali Dawa, and some of them are still going to cling to the lie. And it's just, I mean, guys, how does this not bother you? Seriously, the, the fact that your religion has been propped up by people who are obviously lying to you, who are obviously being deceptive, how does this not bother you? Because, I don't know, it will bother me. Yeah. What are you grinning at? Yeah. <laughs> For some reason, um, after you gave that long speech, I remembered. Uh, I remembered in the past where he made a video and then uh, finished it with, uh, "You have twenty four hours to respond" or something like that. <laughs> it was just... Oh yeah, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, everyone. Um, so the the scientific miracles argument has been debunked. Perfect preservation argument has been debunked. Uh, mathematical miracles argument has been debunked. There are other arguments like like uh, uh, Muhammad's in the Bible have also been debunked, but that's that's one where it's a, going to be a little harder to ad- acknowledge that it's been debunked because that one's actually in the Quran. Yeah. But hopefully they'll realize that that has been debunked just like their others. And I don't know, but uh, their new methodology is giving up the arguments and clinging to social media influencers po- who are popular. That's it. It's, they're giving up on the dawah. I mean, giving up on the arguments and just Sneeko and Andrew Tate will save us. And I have to say, this is, I, I'd say let's make a movie out of it, but. <laughs> actually, Andrew Tate converting to Islam is actually a miracle and just shows that Islam is. Powerful. I've seen that. You could go to the comments on Ali Dawa's video where he's he's talking about, he says the argument has been debunked. The scientific miracles argument has been debunked. He says that in response to Andrew Tate having really dumb reasons. But you can actually look at the comments. There are Muslims who say, Andrew Tate converting is the miracle. That's the miracle. <laughs> a guy converting. Well, what about people who leave? Ah, but no, but but they're not the most Googled at some point last year who was the most Googled man on the planet. And so it's funny if you if you ever just take these and try to put them in logical form. If a man is the most Googled person on the planet and converts to a religion, that means the religion is true. It's a miracle or something like that. You need a premise like that. And how dumb can you possibly be? I don't know. You should actually put this in there, put that into a, a proper form of a, of a formal argument. Or yeah. If the most Googled person converts to Islam, then Islam is true. Andrew Tate is the most Googled uh, person on the planet. Andrew Tate converted to Islam. Therefore, Islam is true. Modus See? ponens, the logic is sound, is the first premise true. Yeah. I'm not convinced that it is. All right, everyone. <laughs> uh, what's What are you laughing at? I, I want to say, I want to point out, I find it kind of sad. Um, it's interesting that Hamza Tortis gives these gives this whole speech and talks about uh, biases and how, um, of course, you will conclude that, that something that somebody tells you about the Quran and its miraculousness in terms of science, you will, of course, find it amazing because you believe in advance that it is that it is true. You have faith. So you are amazed by something that confirms your faith. But then he goes on to somehow explain that the Quran has this unique, uh, multi-dimensional, uh, special <laughs> feature of appealing to all times and, mm-hmm. uh, and and all of that. And that is just, I mean, that's just very clear nonsense, which he only uh, adopts as a result of his, of his biases. And yeah, it's, it's kind of ironic. Yeah. Look, you can actually tie though, you can tie those things together. Uh, Hamza, says that he pointed out to someone, the reason you are thinking that this is scientifically miraculous is you already believe it. And so someone's telling you that there's something amazing here. You're just, oh, yeah, I I agree with that because that's what I already believe. But it's similar with Andrew Tate. If the the most Googled man for a couple months in 2022 converts to Islam, it's a miracle. This is the amazing confirmation. 
What if he had converted to Buddhism? Would they think that is any evidence at all? None. They would think it's none. And so you see yeah. the, the real underlying principle is whatever agrees with Islam, it's true. And whatever is against Islam, it's, it's wrong. And that's just the principle. That's the real principle. Yeah. Uh, Archivarius Bhattacharya said, next to an episode on Muhammad in Hindu books, another big lie. I would say nobody cares about Hinduism uh, anyway, and uh, it's not a fundamental Muslim claim that Muhammad is actually found in Hindu books. That might just be something that you hear. But I think, I, think Zakir Naik has, I think Zakir Naik has argued that in the past, that Muhammad is in the Hindu scriptures and so on. Has, is anyone familiar with that? I seem to recall him making the argument that Muhammad is even in the Hebrew, I mean, even in the uh, Hindu scriptures, which... That should be a pretty good indication of the sort of guy you're dealing with. <laughs> this is a weird, weird dude. Yeah, um, yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are taking off now. There will be some awesome stuff coming up this week. If you don't believe me, wait and see. Stay cheesy. You have 24 hours.